Hi, this is George Alger. Welcome to today's segment of R Ventura TV. Today we're going to be speaking about stereo photography. And joining us is Diego Reese, who is a stereo photographer. Welcome, Diego. And for those who might not know, what is stereo photography? Well, stereo photography is from the 1800s and it involves a camera with two lenses that sees the world in 3D, just like we do with our two eyes. And uh, it involves, the finished product involves using a device. This is known, uh, called the Holmes stereoscope. And you see from an image, this happens to be Ventura. Uh, with this, the two images look identical but they're actually from two different perspectives, uh, just like your eyes are seeing the world, just a little off center. And when viewed through these lenses, they are gonna give, uh, they're gonna merge those two independent images over each other, uh, giving your brain the information it needs for depth. Very good. Um, so do you need to buy a special camera to, to take these kind of images? There are uh, a few cameras that have uh, that are on the market. Uh, a couple of the point and shoots that have uh, since uh, they're no longer produced. But I end up uh, because of the the types of shooting that I do uh, over the past decade, I've been developing rigs like this that allow for a lot of variables in shooting. Uh, when you are seeing the world uh, naturally, you're seeing with the uh, eye separation that what it's like about 70 millimeter or so. Um, and your, your eyes are the equivalent of a 50 millimeter lens. So what happens if you use a 300 millimeter lens or what happens if you space out? That now involves mathematics. And so stereo photography ends up being about working the math, working the geometry of sight to give your brain the information it needs because it's not always more separation equals more uh, powerful 3D. Uh, it'll actually just equal a very big headache. So this device allows me to photograph in concert situations and uh, star trails and nighttime photography. But uh, this, this unit is... Uh, very well used, been all over the country many times, and uh, it just finished up a, a little tour in Santa Paula last a few weeks ago. Very cool. So these are two conventional cameras put inside a frame that you built, and then uh -huh. the separation you have to determine based on math for the distance and or the lens for every single shot that you're, you're, you're composing. Correct. It's, uh, it's kind of like playing the trombone. Uh, <laughs> there's no detents. But after a while, you get, uh, there are things to evaluate in a scene where it's like raising red flags, where you know this is going to be too much and that's going to be not enough. So you find sweet spots that end up almost like a reflex. Um, the more time... Uh, you spend with it, it might take 80,000 shots to to really evaluate a scene accurately and get your uh, your separation proper. Um, I shoot in hyper stereo, which is wider separation than your eyes are, are built with. Uh, and the purpose of that is we as living creatures have the advantage of time. Time gives you, uh, it gives you 3D where normally you, if you were to close one eye, the, you, you're naturally, you would think, well, that's no longer 3D. It's just one perspective. But you know, because we're alive, you're breathing and moving. And that the slightest movement also builds uh, information for your brain to perceive uh, what would be called a parallax, that difference between this moment and that moment. Uh, in a still photograph, though, you don't have the moment before and after. It's a frozen moment. 
So I find that the exact mathematics um, for capturing exactly as we see, uh, it falls a little short because it doesn't have the advantage of time and motion. Uh, so what I'm doing is exaggerating a little bit. The brain, it's, it, there's this gray area where your brain will still process that information, uh, but it gives it more of a dreamlike quality. And especially if you're working with different lenses that are uh, specialty lenses give a, uh, a, a blur and a twist. And uh, I, I kind of go for a more a dreamy fairy tale uh, quality if it, if it goes right. Wow. Now, Diego, could you just briefly comment a little bit more on the history? Because you have brought to my attention that I have seen these stereoscopic images, for instance, from the Civil War. But I remember as a kid, I had these little oh, black yeah. thing. I think they were, well, I don't remember who makes them, but. Oh, they were, man. Oh, yeah, that yeah, sound? yeah. What's that called? Viewmaster. Oh, yeah, yeah. And okay. Did, so, and so that was. That sound without smiling. That's, yeah. we lost ourselves in this. This was, uh, I, uh, we could spend hours and going through um, the travel ones were my favorite, uh, traveling all over the country. But when these came out, uh, I think this was 40, let's say late 40s. Uh, I think it was 49. It was already almost, it was a hundred years after the original invention of the, of the process. So the, uh, the originals were drawings and uh, they were shaped drawings that required a, a big mirror contraption to see these images in 3D. Uh, the later, these ended up being the standard. So with those old, uh, with the with the ViewMaster, the resolution was low. The images were small. Uh, it was the package was great. It was a fun experience. But really, in the 1800s, a stereo card was the that was the the standard. Um, this Holmes format was uh, it was not patented, but the the device itself wasn't patented. So that's what made it become the standard. Uh, before this was the Brewster scope and they were really ornate. They were uh, beautiful wood creations. Uh, the, so they, they, had a, they cost more, they were more uh, delicate, um, but the, these could be stamped out. Uh, earlier ones were all wood, whereas this is, has a metal body. Uh, but yeah, the, that, was the, that was the standard. Um, I still produce cards for international collectors. And this one happens to be Ventura uh, at the pier. Uh, I find myself out in the middle of the night in scary spots. Uh, I favor the two, three o'clock in the morning hours for, for shooting. But uh, making those collections, I, I found that the uh, having just a stereo card, that was, that was neat, but every card had to be like banging over the head, a wow shot. And I found that a lot of my adventures weren't about the wow moment. They were about all the little moments that led up to it. And that's where, that's where the conversations happened and where the discovery of the trail, wherever, wherever we were, that's, that's, that was the parts that I remember. Uh, so that led to book collections. So I think seven books into it now. Um, I returned back to Santa Paula, photographed uh, just the small moments of what makes it, uh, what makes my hometown um, rosy and, and warm in my memory. I've, I've been out of Santa Paula for a little while now, but... Uh, You'll see here that the it's a, the same side-by-side uh, -side format, at just like it was in the 1800s, only with collections like books, uh, you have to have a special viewer that comes with the books. And 
so those fold flat and go in there. But that's the uh, I think that was really the goal was to leave something behind. Uh, a lot of a lot of what I create goes into one home. If it's in the woodworking shop or the stained glass shop, goes into somebody's home. But books were super affordable and easy to easy to get out there at uh and there's a there's an appeal to being in the local artist collection on somebody's bookshelf uh i like the i like that idea that uh when when i would go visit friends in in uh, in new york where i live now uh and you see that little collection of local artists um like man those that seems like a how do I get on that spot on the shelf? And so that's what led to uh, creating books because it was an, a way to tell the greater story of what the experience of living somewhere uh, rather than uh, just a powerful image on the wall. I want the little stories. Well said, and that's a great way to wrap things up because we've run out of time. So. Diego, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. <laughs> Going to say goodbye now. Right on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This is George Alger signing off for this segment of Arventura TV. Until we meet again.